November 6th through the 12th has been designated Ethics Awareness Week by our Chancellor, and all 26 schools in the USG system are having activities this week. We've had a number of things on campus this week. Uh, just last evening, Student Affairs had a phenomenal event where they celebrated their student leaders. We've had trivia questions and winners every day where we have prizes they'll be presented today. And so without further ado, we'll kind of go ahead, have Zena come up, introduce our speaker, and go from there. Please don't leave. We have winners that we need to announce at the end of the program, and you don't want to miss it. Thank you. Good morning, and welcome to Albany State University's guest speaker event. Our speaker today is Jared Benjamin. He is going to speak to us about ethics. Jared Benjamin is the Chief Executive Officer and Senior Principal Consultant for the Lee Firm. He served as a college adjunct professor and student retention expert. He specializes in various programmatic areas including hazing prevention, student development, and curriculum development. And has recently published a number one Amazon news release, the Comprehensive Student Leadership Guide. He is currently a PhD student in the Urban Higher Education Program at Jackson State University and has partnered with more than 200 colleges and universities on leadership training and programming for faculty, staff, and students. Everybody, please give a warm welcome to Jared Benjamin. Now, I've come a couple of times, I want us to be family now. And you know, when you're family, that means we're gonna say some things in the room and family can't be just going to tell on me now. So I'm gonna hold you to that, all right? In preparing to come today, uh, two, two milestones happened most recently. Uh, most recently, my, my three-year-old boys, I uh, got twin sons, they turned three years old. For me, I was incredibly happy about it. We treat birthday parties like big holidays in the house. So uh, we still was wiping icing off various places on the walls in the house because the boys definitely had a, had a time. The other milestone was three days ago, I defended my dissertation at a, a Jackson State University. And finally, um, I got some of my life back. I'm used to flying, reading articles and, and taking notes so that I could do an assignment on time. I rode this time, I slept. I didn't know how I felt to sleep on a plane in the last four years. I've been trying to catch up on work over and over and then try to rear my family. My daughter's 14, and I wrote her a text message in preparing to speak with you this morning. Uh, because I'm often traveling, some of her big events, I tend to miss them sometimes. And she has a volleyball game today. And so I wrote her a sweet message and said, my girl, I'm so proud of you. That you, um, that you got that volleyball team up under your belt. You're handling business. They told me you're the co-captain. She said, yes, Dad. I said, I, I know you're going to knock them dead today. And I'm going to be transparent with y'all. I don't know a lot about volleyball. But I know how to scream for my child. You understand? So normally when I'm there, I do more embarrassing than probably she prefers. But I do my part. She said, I said, but Daddy's going to catch the next game. And I want you to know I'm proud of all that you've accomplished. You're doing great things. You're doing great work. And I'm, I'm always going to be there for you. You're beautiful. You're intelligent. You're amazing. And so who has an iPhone in the room? You know how iPhones work. When they're saying something back, you get like three little dots. Right. So I really was waiting on my message to come back, y'all. I was trying to get my little pep talk on. And I just knew she was going to give me a good one. Y'all, you know she wrote me back and said? Same. <laughs> That's all she, I mean, I didn't give her a paragraph, spilt my heart out. All my baby gave me was same. And then she says, and then she waits till I get, I got in the room, I set my laptop up. She says, Daddy, I heard you, uh, you took a big test in your past. Good job. So I took that because I got a sentence an extra than I normally get from her. So in that moment, I recognized that um, we have a, a, a complete difference in how we communicate with each other, but it doesn't change the value of the communication. Come to find out, her saying was my paragraph. Her, 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 her good job, daddy, which was a dissertation for me, was an exam in her mind. She said, good job. We were just communicating differently, but the intent was the same. So oftentimes we can get lost between intent and impact. And we also get lost in that when it comes to ethics. And so my conversation with today is how can we have transformation through our actions? And what I decided to do is break ethics up into an acronym, and we'll play with this acronym for the remaining of our conversation today. And so we know what ethics is. Some say it's a set of principles. Some say it's a set of rules. I often call it my moral compass. 
It's that thing inside of you that says you really shouldn't do it, but you're like, who looking? Can't nobody see I'm doing it, right? Uh, and, so, um, and so in ethics, what we have to do is we have to kind of make a decision between right and wrong and what side do we want to play on. But the problem with ethics, when you decide to violate or ignore ethics, it becomes a slippery slope. It actually becomes what I like to call a behavior. I tell folks anything you do over 60 days is a behavior. Anything under 60 days is a habit. Habits can be broken with, with, with uh, intentional change, but behavior takes therapy, and I'm not licensed. And so I offer to you, what do we do to ensure that those behaviors don't become normalized on our campus? There's a few things that we're going to talk through. How does integrity play a role, accountability, but also more than anything in this room, I'm standing amongst professionals, so professionalism will be a, a basis of our conversation today. So our first letter in the acronym is E, so we're going to dive into education. Uh, for my faculty members in the room, um, I know right now I'm serving as an adjunct at LSU. I teach quantitative methods and applied calculus. And um, when I put out the syllabus, I stress academic integrity, but oftentimes, especially with artificial intelligence, chat GPT, and all the other things, I tend to get barred work turned in all the time. And they proclaim it's theirs, and I have no issue with it until they, I have to tell them it's not. And then sometimes they turn in barred work and it's still wrong work. And then on the other side of things, um, some of my staff members, that what happens is they forget that we have to be very thought. Thought, thoughtful in our actions because those that are watching us are sponges. I often tell you the students are much like my three-year-olds. Um, the other day, one of my fraternity brothers came by to visit. I was complaining four days ago that every time he come by, he need to borrow something. <laughs> he done borrowed two screwdrivers, four flatheads, my hammer. He always, when I go to Home Depot, I'm shopping for us. I didn't know it. It just it irritates me to the core. When he walk in, I almost want to say what you need. He don't start off with it. He real slick. Hey, Fred, how you doing? Man, you want to have a, have a drink? I brought you a cigar. When he leave, can I borrow your tape measure? I'm like, you always need to borrow something. And so I got to complaining about it. I'm like, Essence, every time he walk in, he needs something. So then uh, yesterday he comes by, and my twin boy, Jerry Jr., said, what you need? <laughs> I was so ashamed. I was like, oh, where you get that from? I'm like, go to your room. Don't be rude. When my friend left, I said, bro, what? He said, dad, I knew he needed something. I'm like, no, I shouldn't have said that in front of him. What happens is he began to normalize what I do. And because what I do, what I do as an adult uh, was validated through my thought process, my own ethic code. Now my three-year-old has made it a practice for himself as well. And so why do you, do you believe that happens at, at the institution? What happens is you may say, oh, it was the gray area. The gray area becomes the black area. And then the black area becomes seen by students. And then we're, we, we're trying to hold students to a standard that we violated. You know how it is. You say, hey, you can't run copies on the copy machine with your party flyers. I know y'all hosting an event, but you done used all the copy machine paper, and you letting everybody know that the probate show going to be on Friday. Uh, I appreciate it. And then I'm telling you don't do it. But he says, why can't I do it? When I looked in the copier, I saw a program from New Birth Missionary Baptist Church, and they had 75 copies jammed in the printer. Y'all using the printer for other stuff. Why can't I use it for other stuff? Ethics. What happens is behaviors become normalized when we don't operate in the space of integrity. Professional conduct. I get it. Arguments happen. We all grown. We get frustrated with each other. In fact, one of my students came to me the other day and said, I have a question, professor. I'm looking like, where this going to go? If you were a professor, I am, and you, somebody turned in something late to you, would you take it? I'm like, oh, where's this going? I said, you know, it just depends on the circumstance. Well, my professor didn't take mine late. Would you have taken it? Depending on the circumstances. I don't know why I answered it like that. She wrote an email to the faculty and CC'd me. Professor Benjamin said he would have took it, depending <laughs> on the circumstances. So I don't know why you didn't take it. I'm like, bro, that's not how I said it. So in that moment, what happens? He don't even email me back. My boy, come walk over to my office. Hey, bro, can I holler at you? I'm like, what's going on? Why would you tell her that? I'm trying to enforce my syllabus. It didn't happen like that. He says, man. And so in that moment, I recognized professionally I had to unpack the situation. I said, depending on the circumstances, I would have taken it. I don't know her circumstances. He said, oh, man, thank you for clarifying, because I thought you was over here telling her I'm supposed to be teaching. Our professional conduct could have been very different had we not been mature enough to handle that conversation. Or if he would have replied to all back. 
Professor Benjamin ain't your teacher. And bro, by the way, stay out of my business in my class. Y'all don't think people reply back like that? So why am I sharing that? When we're talking about ethics, I want you to be very leery with email etiquette. Who don't belong on the CC and the two, just don't put them on. And it's okay to reply to the person that wrote you and not reply to all. I recognize sometimes we use that as a, as a tactic to speed up the reply. I've done it before myself. Sometimes I need things done, I'll CC the provost. The provost don't read it, but it makes the person in the two be like, oh boy, I gotta hurry and process this one. Oh man, yeah, oh. So I'm offering to you, be very leery, because what that can do is cause a gap in professional conduct. And what happens is that clapback that you're gonna get in email becomes normalized with our student population. And you just never know. And I'm gonna be honest with you, I don't got time to read. Sometimes there's more emails in the CC than content in the email. I'm like, did everybody need this? So I want us to be very cognizant of our professional conduct. And lastly, equitable treatment. I want to come to the table by telling you, I come into room with inherent biases. We all come into the room with inherent biases. To be quite honest, I'm from South Louisiana. I was in uh, Boston, Massachusetts at Harvard the other day doing an, uh, a keynote at the uh, School of Business. And y'all, I was hungry. I was running late. I tried to get everywhere an hour before. And, but I struggled. So I had just got done at Northeastern. I'm trying my best to get on a public transportation to get to the school. I get there. I'm sucked in. I'm like, I do want a couple of pictures, too. But when I got to the food court, they had a Popeye's. I'm from South Louisiana. I say, I'm hungry. I got to get something quick. So I go there. I get me a little two-piece, uh, red beans and two biscuits, because I don't eat the top of the biscuits. You know, biscuits be hard sometimes. And so I'm getting my little food, and I bid into the chicken. I learned right then, all Popeye's are not created equal. Oh, my God, y'all, I made a Facebook post. I was so mad. I said, y'all, I'm in Boston. Popeye's ain't where you should go. I'm not going to tell you where I'm at, but don't go to this one. I'm sharing this to tell you something. In that moment, I had my own inherent biases begin to birth, and they birthed loud. If you ain't from the South, you can't cook anyway. I shouldn't even try this food. <laughs> they don't even put no, I thought the season at all. Popeye's get issued the same way. Folk can't even fry chicken. Get them, ooh, these biscuits hard. I start complaining about every part of it then. My spoon, they ain't give me but one napkin. They ain't give me no straw. These folk didn't even say, I said, thank you. I said, hey, how you doing? They kept walking. I meant, how you really doing? And so I'm sharing this to tell you, my inherent biases begin to be birthed by saying, folks in the South, the only folk can cook. So what happens is through inherent biases, we tend to show favoritism or second chances to those that have like identities, like similarities, cultural backgrounds that are similar. But what happens is when you begin to show those kind of treatments, you start violating ethics because what happens is if I see you showing a little favoritism to my bar, you know, now when it's my turn to get that favoritism and you don't, we got to have a conversation a little different. And now we're going to have to talk through the lens of equitable treatment or the violation of ethics. So be sure equitable treatment um, is something that we always think through when we're having our professional interactions with each other. While equitable uh, has so many forms of definitions, it's impossible for us to dismiss all of our inherent biases. You can't park them all because they're inherent. They're a part of your, your makeup. When I walk into the room, to be quite honest, if I'd have went in that back of that room right now and I'd have saw some Louisiana hot sauce, whether all y'all had was sandwiches and chips, I'd have grabbed a little bit of hot sauce because it's a part of my culture. I put hot sauce on everything. And so it's a part of me, you know what I'm saying? So I offer to you, be sure you try to park as much of your biases that you have when you come into the professional space so you don't find yourself um, uh, looking through the lens of education and saying, hey, I've been unequitable inherently, but that wasn't my intent. But what happens is it still is a part of the impact. We want to talk through trustworthiness, the T. Open communication. What I tell folk is try to get to know some of your people. When you try to get to know some of your people, you also need to also try to get to know common microaggressions that are stated in, in, in the professional lens so that we can ensure as leaders we're ethical and also we're, we're respectful that these microaggressions don't become a normalized conversation. And so I'll give you the best example. This chair is my intent and this chair is my approach. The gap between intent and approach is a microaggression. And so it's, it's, it's easy to say I, I grew up in South Louisiana. Um, I went to public school K through 8. My ninth grade year, my mom decided to put me in private school. I played the organ for the neighboring church that actually uh, ran the school, so I got to skip the list. And so when I got into school, I could remember being in Walmart. A lady came over to compliment me. She says, you talk real proper 
for a kid that's from Breeder Town. Her intent was to compliment me, but her approach was microaggressive. What happens is when we permit for microaggressive behavior and become blind to the fact that it exists, we refute open communication, which can create a reduced level of trustworthiness. Fair and consistent treatment. I tell folk all the time, I'm hard, but I'm fair. And being fair, I don't have to worry about you wondering, have I been fair to everybody the same? Try your best to implement policy, not preference. Implement policy, not preference. And guess what? Policy don't always align with preference. I got to be real with you. I got some policies as a couple of institutions I support and work with that outright frustrate me. I'm like, why do I? That don't even make sense. But it's it's not my preference. It's the policy. And so it's important that you uh, fair and consistent treatment is protected by policy, not so much by preference. Then lastly, confidentiality and respect. Every conversation isn't for public consumption outside of the ears who heard the initial conversation. Then also ensure when, we, when, we're, when, we're, when we're advocating for someone or advocating for a policy that we're being fair in implementation and a fair in who it will affect. Who it will affect. That's important too. And so we have open communication by saying, hey, I want to bring everybody in. I'm your department chair. These are the conversations for a policy shift. While I recognize it's going to affect you, it's going to also protect the brand of Albany State University. It's going to protect us in this way. And that's why I'm advocating to support the strategic plan in this way. Do we have a clear understanding? But welcome conversation. Dialogue has to be both ways, but just both ways respectful. Once the dialogue is had, we can say, okay, from this moment, we have a clear understanding of policy. When it moves forward, y'all, we're going to follow it ethically. And they're like, cool. But then they walk out, you ain't going to believe Jared. Everything the president say, he followed. it. He just jump on it. He ain't even consider us. Did you just break confidentiality and respect? I came in with open communication. I was trying to be fair and consistent. But now the conversation has left the room, and what happens is trustworthiness begins to be compromised, and now ethical decision-making now is on ice. And y'all know how on ice work. It depends on the weather. I don't know how y'all weather when we got 41 days, 70 the next. I don't know whether to turn my heat or my air on at my house, or sometimes both at the same time, right? And so honesty, transparent communication. But I want to go to that second bullet where we talk about accountability for a second. Accountability is only effective through assessment when you learn from the feedback. Ethics is always compromised because when we do our assessments, we get the feedback, whether it be a verbal assessment or a formal assessment. But if you don't use the feedback to create change, what happens is there's no transformative actions. Therefore, uh, ethical violations take place because people decide to do it more efficiently, even if efficient is outside of policy. So what I want us to do is be really lean into the feedback that we're receiving as leaders and figure out how can we use that feedback to infuse change so that change keeps us ethical versus people saying, now I'm going to be honest with you, every year we check on this process, this process is broken, but we do it the same way every year. But that's why Jared don't even do it that way. Mm -mm, I don't do it that way. The reason I do it this way because this is how you really get it done. I used to work at an institution in South Louisiana. All of our contracts were net 30. I became the homecoming chair. And some of the artists required payment on spot. And so I, I, couldn't, I, I couldn't believe that we could figure out. And then, oh, and some of them, they had some really, really strange riders. Like, I want 10,000 of it in cash. The rest in check, but it got to be here on the day of. And we figured out how to do it. So now I'm, I'm blown by certain vendors to having net 30 and net 45. Then they told me, oh, Jerry, this is how you do it. You got to go over the accounts payable. You, how, you got certain folk you talk to, and you know what I'm saying? You just tell them, I said, they, they work it out. So guess what Jerry did? Went over to accounts payable. Hey, I'm looking for the lady who know how to get this stuff processed, you dig? they like, who? I'm like, it must be you. <laughs> so now I didn't, I didn't figure out how to, you know what? On fried chicken Fridays, I'm going to go get her extra plate, bring it over to accounts payable. I ain't saying you're hungry, but if you're hungry, there you go. <laughs> What is taking place ethically? Now, everybody who needs to be processed, where my paperwork going on top, right? Also, the, the net 30 process 
has now been violated. Is it a broken process? It was. Was it necessary? It wasn't. But it was policy. And because I decided to be unethical, I found the person who could move it a little bit quicker. Now the people who are at net 30 are now going to be net 45 because all of my paperwork didn't skip theirs. And my good friend Vanessa then got a chicken plate out the calf. And so it's important that we remain um, uh, receptive to feedback. So if we need to make pivots, uh, we, can, we can refute some unethical behavior because some of it is based off preference or uh, causing a, uh, addressing a gap that has been consistent feedback, but we haven't made any changes due to that feedback. And then lastly, truthful representation. Not the truth that benefits you, the truth that's fact. Not the truth that benefits the justification of your actions, but the truth that's fact. Even if the truth is, I was dealing with a student that needed a little wraparound services, so what I decided to do is extend my deadline and accept the assignment anyway. My question would be, did we open up the deadline for all of our students? Well, no, ain't no well. Because if, if you're telling me no, it's unethical. You know, um, so yeah, I got, I got this one person I recognize, you know, sometimes her husband worked the late shift. He can't get to the daycare facility, so I let her off at, you know, 4.15 sometime to go get her baby. Do we open it up for everyone who has those same needs to be accommodated, or are we only doing it for one? Well, I can understand and empathize because I got kids. I still have to offer it to you. It's unethical. Or, you know, I get it, man. Sometimes, you know, they work so hard. I don't really trip on how long they lunch be, long as the work get done. Okay. So do you hold your students to the same level of accountability if they need to come by your office late? After hours? At seven? Because you took a two-hour lunch? Do you make students come to class on time if you're not coming to work on time? So it's kind of like they only going to absorb the behavior that they see, and then what happens is the slippery slope of unethical behavior becomes a normalized uh, activity. Integrity, use of resources reporting. Reporting, I want to leave this in our funding spaces for a quick second. When it comes to reporting, especially a lot of grant funding, I've been doing some consulting work for the Department of Education, specifically around Department of Education funding opportunities, where some folks have been reporting numbers that don't align with their serving, the, the populations they're serving. And so let's just be very intentional with our student-facing offices. Y'all know what I mean when I say student-facing offices. Be sure you have some kind of data-driven mechanism to capture sign-in sheets. So when we're talking about how many people we're serving, we're using uh, factual data. That level of integrity is important, and it also equips your, your leadership with uh, uh, advocacy tools when it's time to advocate for coins because I can use it against metrics and numbers, but don't inflate those reporting numbers. Use of resources on the academic side. Cite who you use and, and who you don't cite, don't use. You know, it's important that even, even on the administrative side, when you borrow a tool, I, I've, I've, I've looked at some strategic frameworks of other institutions, just use that fine print on the bottom and say, derived from. And list the institution. That way what happens is no, at no point unethical behavior becomes a normalized uh, behavior under this leadership. And then remember, you are a model whether you chose to or not. Um, as I'm preparing for commencement season again, when I worked at FIU as Associate Vice President of Academic Affairs, I would go to the uh, commencements. We had 17 commencements. I made it my business to go all six days to all of our commencements because I felt like that's when they go into the finish line, they should get their biggest support. We had a large international student population, and we also had a large first-gen population. Sometimes a lot of folk wouldn't scream in their name, but I knew me and my family would go scream. We literally would just go to the commencements, and they knew it. It was a family thing in my house. Get ready. It's commencement season. We're going to all of them. So we would go to these commencements, and one of the young men walked up to me and said, do you remember me? I wanted to lie bad, y'all. I wanted to I would be like, yes, I remember you. I was afraid he was going to say, what's my name? Then I was going to be in a bind. So instead, I said, I remember you, um, but I don't know from where. He said, you taught me my freshman year, first year experience. He said, man, I, I went to the career closet. I got me four suits because I noticed you wear a suit Monday through Thursday. And so I start wearing suits Monday through Thursday to class. On Fridays, you wear a polo. I get to class 10 minutes early because I noticed when you taught us, you got there 10 minutes early and stayed 20 minutes behind. I didn't get to see you that much after you taught me, but I want to tell you I'm going to miss you. Man, I dapped him up. It turned into a hug. But in that moment, I noticed he was modeling my behavior, even when I didn't ask to be his role model. I'm sharing with you 
There's several other students. Y'all be at homecoming. How many folks come back to your homecoming and be like, I miss you? you like, I don't miss you. <laughs> right, right, right. And so I offer to you, they miss you because there was something about your behavior that they modeled. So I offer to you, we must ensure that they're modeling our ethical behavior, not modeling things that we're doing poorly. Right. And so and, and that's and what happens is they begin to absorb it. And so I, I offer to you, what are you doing that you want to be modeled? And what are you doing that you don't want to be modeled? That's some self-awareness moments. You know, for me, I was like, hey, man, I mean, at lunch, I shop on Amazon. But if the sale hit my phone a little early and it's still 2 p.m., I might get back on Amazon. I ain't shopping that long. Now, it ain't like I'm just staying on Amazon. But then when I be on Amazon, I don't know how when I go back to Facebook, it go in the column and show me some of the stuff I shopped for. So it calls me back. I got this dream car. I've been building this Tesla for four years on the clock. I build the car. I close the post and I build it right back at 2.30. In between classes, it ain't my fault that Nike had a sale. In Polo State, he texted me saying, come to the Polo store, 30% off. It's Christmas. So I go to the Polo site on the clock. I'm offering to you. We have to be ethical. Those systems are used for what? And we don't really think about it in the moment. It don't hit us until we start lecturing a class or coming to visit a class. And you notice you look behind the screen and everybody on their social media platform and nobody's watching the slides that you worked so hard to brief. And you want to hold them to a standard. But then they tell you, how can you hold me to a standard when I'm modeling behavior? Just kind of think through that level of integrity. Collaboration. Be respectful of diverse perspectives. Being from South Louisiana, I had a very close perspective. I got to be honest with you. Um, uh, most of my family is faith-based, but it was of Christian faith. And so my first institution was uh, Florida Memorial University. I could remember when I got to lead a meeting, Dr. Rosalyn Artis, she was the president at the time. She says, Jared, you're going to take charge of my absence and lead this meeting. I got ready to lead the meeting. The provost said, excuse me, we, we lead with prayer at this institution. I know how to pray. No problem. So I prayed. For four years, that's how we started all our meetings. I got to FIU. They said, it's your turn to lead a meeting. I said, bow your heads. Now, God, we come to you right now in this season. <laughs> now, after we got done, Dr. Cram said, Jared, great meeting, but can I chat a second? She said, we have to be more inclusive. Maybe the next time, if you feel like it's necessary to lead the meeting that way, we'll just give everybody a moment of reflection to reflect their own way. It had hit me because I, normal I had normalized one way of opening meetings. I didn't think about everybody else at the table that may not have had the same faith as me. So in that moment, I recognized I had to be respectful to diverse perspectives. It didn't bother me much, but it also taught me how to be an advocate and an ally. An advocate is someone who, 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 who bats for you based off their learned experiences. Uh, uh, I mean, lived experiences for ally, learned experiences for advocates. So I don't know about y'all on campus. I'm rather nosy. If I see students gathering, I need to know why. I walks up on them. What are you doing? We, we nosy. OK, cool. No problem. So I'm nosy. I, I walk up on a group of students. They were getting a box lunch. It was about eight o'clock at night. I'm leaving my office, throwing my backpack on. I'm like, what are y'all doing with these box lunches? They said, oh, nothing. Just grabbing something to eat. What group is this? Oh, we're just some students. What group is this? You know, when you say it twice, they hear it. Give me your ID card. Somebody got an ID card. Give me one of them. I took a picture of it. And you know what's going on. Oh, we just got done with our, our fast. We're, we're of Muslim faith. It's Ramadan. We're just grabbing our bite to eat. OK, thank you. I got on Microsoft Teams, wrote the provost. I'm a bit confused on why these students are paying full room and board, but got a cold meal in the evening based off their religious identity. What are we doing here? The next morning, the CAF makes an announcement, said the CAF will be open till 10 p.m. for the next 45 days. Now, that Muslim faith isn't my lived experience, it's my learned experiences. Because I have respect for diverse perspectives, I was able to advocate for those students. You see how that works? Welcome diverse perspectives because it can change how we can support those that are around us to our left and our rights. We may not all put hot sauce on our food, but we all still are working hard for Albany State University. We may not, we not all have come from the same faith, came from the same upbringing, had the same rearing, but we all have a contribution to bring through our own lens of diverse perspectives. A distribution of work. I'm talking to my leaders that tend to have to do it all sometime through their own thought processes. I have a strength and a weakness. One of my strengths is I teach some topics that don't always come from, um, um, come from folks with young spirits. That's what I'm going to offer. That's the way I'm going to word that. 
Uh, sometimes in class, I'm sitting in the desk and my students walk in and say, if the, Falcon, if the teacher don't get here in 10 minutes, we're leaving. You know the rule. I'm like, that's what I'm talking about. In 10 minutes, I'm leaving too. And then I walk around and start handing out the syllabus. They're like, oh, you the teacher? My bad, bro. I'm like, no pressure, no pressure, no pressure. So I teach the class and I offer to you this. Um, that's a strength I have. But a weakness I have is I struggle to delegate. Not because I want to do it all, it's because I don't know if you're going to deliver with the same value of excellence that uh, is attached to my leadership, my name, or my brand. So I tend to do it and put you, I'll put your name on it too. I don't care. I add you to the slide. I just need the work done at a level of excellence. What happens is I don't fairly distribute work because I begin to look at folk and make inherent biases and judgments and perspectives based on the quality of the work they'll deliver. And so I offer to you it's important that you fairly distribute work because when you choose to not do that, we begin to walk down that slippery slope of unethical practices. And what happens is, uh, oh, because you did more and he did less, don't worry about Friday. Just stay home, my boy. No pressure. You do so much for us. And I'm going to tell you, we're going to be staying late this Friday because we got a lot going on today, all right? <laughs> you see how that worked? Is that ethical? No. No, no, no. So it's important that we fairly distribute work. And then um, ethical decision processes, if you don't feel like you can make a decision with reduced biases, bring a, bring a secondary decision maker in. Only give the facts and let them make the decision. I begin to do that in some departments where I redact the name, redact the department, give the facts, and be sure that their decision align with mine. And when it does, I feel good. I'm like, yes, I'm on point. And when it doesn't, I'm like, I got a little work to do, but it's okay. At least I brought somebody to help me process the thought processes. Be sure that we're thinking through that. And then when we talk about service, I want to park in that place of social responsibility. I know when we hear social responsibility, we start thinking about, should I go volunteer at the soup kitchen? You know, should I, should I go uh, turn in some canned goods? Should I go serve at the local church? Those are areas of social responsibility, but we have an area that didn't make it to your job description. You got to be a mentor to these students. You got to be an example for them to follow. You got to exercise some of your soft skills when they don't deserve it. You got to give conflict resolution and respect in spaces where you might not get it given to you initially. You know, I even have to give brief mini sessions on effective communication. I write an email back. My, my, my student writes me back and says, K. Hey, man, I'm trying to get an extension on my assignment. No problem. Come see me. What was wrong with your email? I'm going to give you a pen and your printed email and let's work through it together. You mad or something? I'm not. <laughs> I just want to unpack this a little more with you. Okay, so let's start from the beginning. Hey, man, how far do you think that got me on the email? Do you think I read it after that? Well, I wrote it. Did I read it? Did you? No. What, what would you have liked me to say? Well, you wrote me in the morning. You could have started with good morning. Okay, okay, I can do that. And then, am I your professor? I am Professor Benjamin. I am late ownership with my assignment based on the syllabus requirements. My hope is that we could allow an extension based on this circumstance, only state facts. Facts that could be proven. He's like, well, I mean, I ain't really got no facts. I just didn't do it. That's fair. That's fair. That's fair. That's fair. At least you're being honest. He's like, all right, that's cool. That's cool. I appreciate that. And guess what? I don't know who you are because you wrote me from your Gmail. You have a university account, correct? And you have an ID number that helps me find you quite fast when I'm looking in Canvas trying to figure out who writing me. I don't even know if I teach you. You didn't put no name. Well, you couldn't tell who it was? No, it says rude boy <laughs> 2021 at gmail.com. I don't know any rude boys. He's like, oh, I can feel where you're coming from. My bad, my bad, my bad. So are we good? I took that moment exercise social responsibility, and gave an effective communication and email etiquette. Many little workshop in that moment. Did I have to do it? No, but I don't want them to just graduate. I want them to graduate workforce ready as good representation of who we are. Right? I want them to graduate knowing ethically, you got to do better. Ethical, ethical community relationships, what does that mean? Don't promise people no favors just for partnership. I get it. I don't know who my grant writers are, but I'm a grant writer. And when I need that letter of support, that letter of support is to support me. It doesn't mean on the condition I'm going to get you some money out this grant. Right. Hire folks that are qualified. You know what that means? 
uh, when we talk about ethical, that means I don't need to tell you what buzzword is going to get you through HR because your performance is going to expose the gap. And so we have to be very ethical. I don't mind telling you, man, list what you got, interview your best, and we make something work. And if I get you, I'll train you. But I don't want you telling me that you done published 19 peer-reviewed articles and you can't form a sentence in an email. I don't want you to tell me you've managed a $1. million dollar budget and then when I give you 10000 you can't even manage a, a purchase card. You know, we start looking at it a little funny, like, I don't know if this, this math ain't mathing. And so I need us to be very intentional, intentional in building ethical community relationships that don't require a favor in return of the relationship. Are we clear? And then lastly, mentor, mentor, mentor. Not just folks that are un, uh, 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 investors. I call the students investors because they're expecting a return on their investment. Not just investors, our colleagues as well. Be receptive to mentorship, no matter if you've been here since they laid the first brick, or if you've been here since the first, this semester. Because there's always evolving change when it comes to higher education. And everybody will feel like they belong when their ideas are heard. And so I make it my business. Even when I was a vice chancellor, I even met with the coordinators once a month. They say, why would you meet with the coordinators? They got their own director. Because you may not give me their version of the story. And I want them to feel like they belong here. Ain't no point in me hiring them, inviting them to the dance, and I'll never go dance with them. So they chance to dance is they one hour a month. And so it's important that you're dancing with everybody so that everybody feels valued on the team. And then what, what it would do is it builds a level of trust where I'm like, you know what? I don't want to violate, right? And so intent versus impact. Y'all, um, sometimes I get to go fishing when my travel schedule permits. And now that I got my little boys and they can walk on their own, I ain't got to hold them. I bring them to the boat with me. We go fishing together. But you have to train Jared Jr. Aiden is daddy's boy, but Jared Jr. is mama's boy. And Jared Jr. tells all of the truth, no matter what. However it come out, where it need to come, it don't matter. You got to watch what you say. He'll even say it in church. Whatever he thinking, he going to say it. So don't talk about nobody around Jared. Don't do nothing wrong, because Jared going to expose you real fast. You know, it's a grocery store called Rouse Market in, in South Louisiana. I don't like to go to Rouse that much because they high. And, you know, one of my friends was like, hey, man, we're going to run by Rouse. Jerry said, don't go there, they high. <laughs> Ain't nobody asked him to share all the stuff I be saying in the house. It's in the house business, you know what I'm saying? And so we go fishing, and to be quite honest, y'all, I didn't catch nothing that day. I was a little ashamed, but I knew if I swung by the fish market, who going to know? So I said, hey, man, give me like eight of them redfish, give me four of them catfish, clean them but keep the heads on them. He looked at me. Matter of fact, throw two red snappers in there, too. You feel me? Keep the head on them, though. So what I did was I took them out the packaging. Y'all said we family, don't y'all judge me. I took them out the packaging, and I threw them in the bucket, you understand? And when I opened up the garage, Essence ran out. She said, baby, you back. I love you. I said, ooh, you're about tired from fishing. I got this bucket full of fish, you feel me? She was like, oh, my God, you caught all of that? I'm like, yeah, Aiden, looking at me with the wink like, yeah, daddy. I'm like, yeah. I said, Aiden. Richard, give him a pocket knife. He gave him a pocket knife. I whip it out real cool like I've been fishing all day. Cut two of the heads off, threw it in the yard. I said, yeah, but I'm going to clean these fish. You're going to get in the house. We're going to have fish tonight. She said, oh, my God, my baby caught all these fish. Jerry Jr. looking at me like, <laughs> I'm like, bro, now right now I'm trying to ignore him because he's my accountability partner. And so we get in the house. I start battering the fish up. I fry the fish. We get a little light bread. She make a little quick potato salad. You know, I like a little green beans. We, we, we eat good. I invite a few friends over. Her girlfriend and her go get their nails done the next day. She say, hey, God, your husband need to go fishing with my man. She say, why? She say, boy, he caught a dolphin. <laughs> she said, a dolphin in fresh water? She said, yes, girl, they were so big, the fish, he caught a dolphin. He was, she was like, well, that's all right, I'm going to let my man know, no problem. She go home that evening, she said, babe, I got something I need to tell you. He said, what's happening? You ever thought about going fishing with Jared? Well, he fish all the time, I should, huh? He caught a shark. A shark? A shark in fresh water? Well, I, that's all right, though. It was big, they had fish all over the place. They've been eating fish for two days, over the Oh, man. So he come to me, bruh. We at the barbershop. He's like, I need to holler at you about something. I'm like, what's up? He said, you went fishing the other day? Yeah, bro, I caught two buckets. He said, my wife told me you caught a whale. <laughs> I said, a whale? I said, but I said, Tim, to be honest, bro, I ain't catch nothing. Bro, we ain't got me a little fish from the fish market, you understand? Bro, we went a little empty-handed that day. So I ain't want to come home empty-handed. I've been gone five hours. 
I, I, I left with a case of beer and empty buckets. I came back with no beer. I had to put something in the bucket. <laughs> he was like, oh, well, where did he get all that from? To be honest, y'all, my intent was to show up with something. But the impact called an inflation of story. I'm asking you through the professional lens, how many times has our intent not matched our impact and caused an, 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 an uneth unethical actions? Oh, it's no big deal. I always get here. Six o'clock every morning, I'm here to serve the students. How you get six o'clock out of eight ten? <laughs> I'm so sick of staying late. I stay late every day. I ain't been home early this month. I stay till 5.02 p.m. every day. <laughs> they don't pay me till just 5, but 5.02, I'll be here. I'm late. I'm the Y'all know it get dark early now. It's been 5.15, I'm in the dark. The lights be off on the whole campus. It just be me at 5.02. I'm asking that we ensure our impact always matches our intent so it can refute unethical behavior. Now I had to pack, up, pack myself up, run to, my, run to Essence and say, babe, I got to tell you the truth. She said, what? I ain't catch none of them fish. She said, I knew I read it. I said, how? She said, Jerry Jr. I said, mama... <laughs> I got something I got to tell you. I'm like, boy, that boy be telling on me bad. She said, you know he loved me. He told me that day, but I'll let you go and fry the fish and keep your little story going. I said, why you do me bad like that? She said, Jared, you know Jared Jr. going to tell if nobody else tell it. I'm asking for a bunch of Jared Juniors to be in the room today. Let's remain ethical because ethical keeps the doors open. Ethical keeps accreditation. Ethical pushes persistence. Fair treatment, even if it's hard sometimes, causes semester, semester persistence and year-to-year -year retention. So now when we're recruiting, we don't have to sell wolf tickets. To be honest, I don't have to recruit and inflate numbers. The numbers will be true to themselves, and my students will come because we're the best option in the university system of Georgia, not because we're their option. And so to remain the best option, we have to be ethical in all things that we do. I'm just asking that you make the hard decision, because oftentimes the shortcut, it grows addictive. And you begin taking the shortcut so often that you don't even know the long, true route anymore to get there. And so I remind my students, a shortcut can work temporarily. But when an obstacle is in the shortcut way, you got to come back the long way. And it's going to be an unfamiliar route to you. I don't want us having to take unfamiliar routes to success when success is right in front of us. I offer to you, my time is about up, but your time to be ethical, yet it's continuing. Pull out your smartphones if you don't mind. Pull them out, pull them out, pull them out. Everybody's scanning the code on the screen. The code is talk. Catherine and her leadership team. The message today was timely, relevant, and impactful. And as a small token of our appreciation, we want to give you this. Thank you so much. Also, during the last month, we've had nominations for the Shining Ram Award. I must say, it was difficult. I'm glad I wasn't a judge. They were thoughtful, inspiring, and we have one faculty member and one staff member. So at this time, I would like to announce the winner for the faculty Shining Ram Award, Dr. Antashe Jones. My chair told me I just had to be here. I'll just read just a little bit about what came in on Dr. Jones' nomination. Dr. Jones, an assistant professor in the Biological Science Department, has been an outstanding faculty at Albany State University for more than five years. She's very passionate about imparting knowledge to ASU scholars and goes above and beyond the call of duty for all of her students. Dr. Jones provides valuable experiences and opportunities for her students by working on various grants that will benefit them once they leave her classroom 
and prepare them for either the workforce or continuing their education. She has participated in and encouraged ASU students to broad, broaden their knowledge globally through study abroad programs where she has traveled to Jamaica, Europe, and the United Kingdom, educating ASU students on different cultures and other scientific methods used in other countries. So congratulations to Dr. Jones. Next, we have a staff member. At this time, we would like to call Mr. Reginald Christian. <laughs> we got you, we got you. Mr. Christian, our campus photographer, has been a dedicated employee of Albany State for almost 30 years. He has diligently served under five presidents as the campus photographer. However, he has been commonly referred to as the campus mayor <laughs> for the many hats that he has worn. Besides campus photographer, he has been a driver for presidents when necessary, campus guests, student events, and athletic events. He works tirelessly at evening and weekend events, both on and off campus, to capture lasting memories of events such as pageants, convocations, galas, summer programs, all sporting events, and at all graduations. Just last night, he was at the VIP for VP. We sat together and I had to encourage him to be here today to receive this award. He didn't know. I have veterans day. I won't be here. So can someone say It's hard to surprise Reggie, but it was important that we you know, just have him here today. But thank you so much, Dr. Jones, Reggie. There's so many Dr. Jones and so many Reggies in this room. And I encourage you, when those times come around to nominate an employee, a colleague, those nominations came from someone outside of their own area who see and recognize the good that they do each and every day. So thank you so much for what you do. Continue to do great things here at Albany State. And that concludes our program for today. Thank you so much for participating.